While Attorney General Chris Mays leads an investigation into the so-called fake electors, top Republicans in the legislature begin investigating her. She joins us to talk about it. Carrie Lake has admitted fault in the defamation suit brought by County Recorder Stephen Richer. Now it's up to Richer to prove damages. You'll hear from him. And our panel looks at those stories and the rest of the week's headlines next on Politics Unplugged. Good evening, I'm political editor Dennis Welch. This is Politics Unplugged, and Republican leaders in both the state House and Senate have opened investigations into Democratic Attorney General Chris Mays. It's happening as Mays looks at possible charges for the so-called fake electors, a group that included some of the same GOP leaders. The Attorney General joins us now to talk about all of this. Um, and yes, the latest uh, effort here is that the, in the House, they created an ad hoc committee that is uh, focused on you. They say that you are, uh, you know, malfeasance of government, that you are not following the law. They cited uh, one, uh, specific examples um, where you, they say you didn't follow the law. Um, I want to get, first of all, your reaction. You have called this a political stunt. Yeah, look, you know, Dennis, I guess the, there are a handful of Republican legislators who aren't used to an attorney general who does her job. Um, and that's what I'm doing. You know, uh, we are busy fighting the fentanyl crisis, going after the Mexican drug cartels, protecting our groundwater resources, protecting our consumers against unfair rent increases, uh, you know, combating and prosecuting elder abuse. And that's what I'm going to keep doing. This is a stunt. I don't think it's any surprise, Dennis, that this is coming from two guys who are running against each other in a Republican primary for Congress. Yeah, you're talking about uh, Ben Tillman, the House Speaker. Um, he, you know, uh, in, in the House, they've opened the ad hoc committee there. Um, you're talking about Anthony Kern over in the Senate and Correct. his Judiciary Committee launched an investigation into you about a month ago. Uh, one of the things that they uh, have mentioned is they've mentioned uh, the transgender, uh, tran new transgender law that would prevent transgender girls from participating in sports. They say you're refusing to prosecute that law. What say you about that? Well, look, I mean, this, this is something that, you know, we feel, uh, you know, number one, uh, had uh, legal issues associated with it, constitutional issues. And uh, secondarily, you know, there, there are resource allocation uh, decisions that my office has to make. And, um, you know, so we made those, you know, I know that those legislators are involved in, in, in that case, but that's the decision that we made and certainly something that we would back up uh, all the way. And they've also cited the fact that you have said while you were a candidate and since you've been in office, you're not going to prosecute any type of uh, abortion laws that are stricter, uh, that are strict uh, abortion laws on that. Um, that's correct. The, the, the question for you is, aren't you elected to enforce the laws no matter what you think about them? Well, first of all, I, you know, as you know, I think those abortion laws are unconstitutional. So, no, I don't enforce unconstitutional laws. And, you know, we are fighting that 1864 abortion law, that abor total abortion ban that the legislature wants to impose on the women of Arizona yeah. in the Supreme Court. I anticipate that decision coming uh, down soon. Ultimately, the people of Arizona are going to have the last say in the form of a ballot initiative that would enshrine abortion rights uh, in the Constitution. So, you know, that, that, that's where we're at with that. <laughs> okay, and any word on when uh, this committee is going to meet? Any word it's, it's going to hear? And, and, and side note to that, have you heard from the other, uh, the Judiciary Committee in the Senate that is uh, sensibly investigating in you? You know, honestly, we haven't heard a word from either of them. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I, you know, I'm really not sure what they're doing, except that they're wasting a lot of time. It would be nice if the legislature, especially the majority party in the legislature, would focus on issues that matter to mm -hmm. Arizonans, like protecting our water supplies, combating the Mexican uh, drug cartels, protecting Arizonans against consumer fraud. All of those things are things that my office is working on and will continue to work on. 
despite their uh, political hijinks. Yeah, and one thing you say is a political center. We've mentioned that they are running for Congress, and it's it, another issue we have, do have to address. I know you can't say much about that. It's the fake electors. You have been investigating them. It's the group of 11 uh, people who signed documents uh, falsely certifying that they were the uh, uh, correct electors uh, for the state of Arizona in 2020. Um, I have to ask you about that. How much do you think this is playing into these decisions to open investigations into you? Yeah, and as I've said before, either I, there's not much I can say about that investigation, except that we are conducting uh, an investigation into the fake electors. We will have an announcement uh, soon on that. We will have something to report to the people of Arizona. It was very important and continues to be very important to me, Dennis, to allow the professional attorneys and investigators in the AG's office to do their work um, and to make sure that justice is done. And, and that means doing a thorough investigation, not rushing the investigation, and, and we will have something to report. You know, I'll let, I'll let uh, smart guys like you and pundits like you and others um, to, uh, decide uh, what all of this sort of uh, side activity means. Yeah, and, and, and we'll be, should, we will be talking about this a little bit later in, in the show that Anthony Kern did hold a press conference outside of the courthouse earlier this week. He didn't say why he was there, and he was asked that he'd been subpoenaed in relation to, to your investigation. Again, I know you can't say much about that, but for people who are wondering um, about this, how much longer uh, can they expect this investigation to go on? Because uh, let's face it, what they did was in the light of day. They were, you know, they videotaped themselves doing all this. And a lot of people look at this and say, well, they either broke the law or they didn't. And they're going to file charges or not. How much longer is this going to play out? Yeah, I would say, first of all, I think it's a little more complicated than that. And, and so, again, I, th I think it's important to allow our investigators and our lawyers to do their work, allow the justice system to do its work. Um, I would also uh, just ask for a little more patience because, as, as we know, Michigan and Georgia had basically a two-year head start on us uh, because my predecessor made the decision, um, and I don't know why he did that, to not investigate this case at all. Mm -hmm. And let's uh, finish up here on another topic. Uh, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about water. You held some uh, some some hearings uh, and listened and talked about water in other parts of the state, specifically addressing uh, the, you know the Saudi business groups that are still pumping water out yeah. of Arizona. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yes. Yeah, so we've had two town halls now uh, in uh, uh, yesterday in Wendon, Arizona, in La Paz County, and uh, down in Cochise County in Pierce, Arizona. Uh, in both places, uncontrolled uh, deep water corporate uh, uh, well uh, pumping is impacting nearby residents and causing things like cracking in homes. Uh, fissures are opening up in the ground in Cochise County near a Minnesota dairy uh, that has plopped 700 wells into that community. And then, you know, in Wendon and in Vicksburg, in La Paz County, where I just w was, we had 130 people turn out, Dennis, to express their concerns about the fact that we still have the, are allowing, the state is still allowing the Saudis and the Emiratis to pump an unlimited amount of groundwater out of the ground. So I'm, I'm taking the, the step of investigating that. We have sent investigators out to talk to the people in these communities, and we are actively considering um, whether we can use the state's nuisance laws to um, protect those people. Yeah, all right, well, we have to end the segment right there. I wanna thank you very much for taking some time to join us here today, and welcome back Thanks, anytime, man. of course. And still ahead, Carrie Lake admitted fault in the defamation suit filed by county recorder Stephen Richer. So what are the damages? He joins us to talk about it next, right here on Politics Unplugged. Welcome back to Politics Unplugged. This week, Carrie Lake made the surprise move of asking for a default judgment in the defamation suit brought by County Attorney Stephen, uh, County Recorder Stephen Richer. It means she admits fault and now wants Richer to prove damages in the case. Stephen Richer is here to talk about that. I want to thank you very much for being here to talk about all of this. And what does this mean that now you yeah. have to prove damages? What are you going to be proving? How were you damaged? 
Well, it's a little perplexing. We did not anticipate this because this is coming from somebody who really to told all of Arizona that she was going to fight to the bitter end. Well, mm -hmm. she lied about that. Who told Arizona that she was looking forward to discovery. Well, she lied about that. Who told Arizona that she could easily establish that the 2022 election was stolen and that I did the things that she did. Well, she lied about that as well. So now what we're going to do is we're going to request the necessary documents from her side, get my documents, and we're going to lay out a case in front of a jury that will establish our damages, and this is going to look like the Rudy Giuliani case, this is going to look like the Fox case, this is going to look like the E. Jean Carroll case. And, and what kind of uh, documents are you going to be asking from her side? Who'd she talk to? Who'd she tell this to? Did she tell people, don't support this person because he's a, he's a, he's a thief, he's a criminal? Mm -hmm. and, and this is somebody who delights in telling us that she has millions of followers, all of whom hang on her every word and believe in everything that she said. Well, she told those millions of followers, not once, not twice, but like 30 times, that I'm a criminal who committed these heinous crimes. And so unringing the bell on that is going to be no small feat, but we're going to calculate exactly what would go into unringing that bell. Sure, but what about the idea that this is politics? As they say, it's not beanbags. This is not beanbags part. What about that? It's, it, can be, it can get kind of rough. And she, what she has said now is yep. that you have to prove that her words hurt you. So politics is saying you're a twerp, as she said yesterday. Politics is making fun of my hair, as she said yesterday. Uh, politics is not lying about a very specific crime. And so we're going to bring in expert testimony that's going to show. We also have some very material costs in terms of security. We also have people who have gone to jail because they believed what she said about the November 2022 election then they made threats to me. Some of those people will be spending two plus years in prison because of the lies that she told about me and about the election. And you're talking about the threats that were made against you. The threats that were made against me, people who were responding to the things that were being said about the November 2022 election. Okay, and now we talked a little bit about the documents that you want from her. What are you going to be showing her? Is it that more of that kind of evidence you just spoke about? More of that kind of evidence, and, exactly. And, 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 and so the big question is, what's the number? You know, people are going to know, like, you know, you brought up the Rudy yeah. Giuliani case. That was a, a different case, different state. Right. Um, $148 million was awarded in that. What's the number you want to settle with? It's going to be, well, we're not settling. And at this point, she hasn't come to us with a settlement offer. That is something that we would entertain. But we have not established that in our complaint because we have to go through this factual intensive process. And then we will delineate that to a court. But it will be significant. Uh, just as her comments have been significant, just as her reach has been significant, just as the amount of security measures that we've had to undertake to react to these comments have been significant. Okay, and in, in the, the big thing is, it, I believe initially, you were saying part of any settlement with her, if you were to agree with a settlement or this case, you want an admission from her, a public admission in some fashion, yeah. that she was not truthful or that she lied about you and the elections in this. Is this still something that you are insisting upon? Well, she's admitted that effectively because by entering a default judgment, she will have in a court of law that she lied about me, she defamed me, she lied about the 2022 election. That's about as much of a white flag as you can get. Now, that's not an, a nicely worded apology note. Um, I don't know what the future of that is, but for anyone who wants to know could Carrie Lake establish what she said about the 2022 election? All you have to do is look at this case, and she defaulted on that, and judgment will be entered against her. Yeah, but, you know, a, a, you know, nicely worded notes aside or not, but with this default judgment, right. you've seen what she, is, what she has been saying since then. Well, she is keep saying that she's been <laughs> truthful about the election. Which is an interesting strategy, because if she continues to broadcast that I am a criminal, if she makes these statements again, then that is something that we will absolutely be watching for both the calculation of damages and also for future legal action. Because now, moving forward, we will have a judgment in court that says these are defamatory remarks that you conceded to. And so if she makes future defamatory remarks, that's a slam dunk. Okay, and then just to be clear then, so you are kind of, you are just backing off of that, uh, that, that demand that you want something in writing that she lied about. If she too. came to us with a settlement and said, you know what, now I don't want to do discovery even on damages. Now I don't want to proceed with hiring expert testimony. Now I don't want to proceed with this damages trial. And she said, how can we make this go away? Then we would be talking about a, a, a note acknowledging the inaccuracy, 
falsity of her claims. Okay, and uh, what have you been making about her comments? You, she, uh, you follow bizarre. Twitter? You've been on Twitter. Bizarre. You've seen some of the stuff. What have you been making B of those? B bizarre. I, I, I don't know how you can say out of one side of your mouth, I can't prove these things, I default, I have defamed you, and then going online and saying everything I said was, was true. Um, again, we're watching all of that. We're adding all of that up. And so it's it's a legal strategy unlike I've, any I've ever seen before. And, and let me ask you too: they have they, they have made a lot. Of, they've made an issue out of the fact that the East Coast lawyers that uh, are helping you uh, and what. Explain to our viewers who are the lawyers that have been helping you out. Yeah. What are they getting paid? You know, at, at one point she was talking about who my lawyers were, and I think some other personal attribute of me. And when you're not talking about the facts, when you're not talking about the law, you're instead talking about where my lawyers domicile, then I think that's pretty telling about the strength of your case. So my attorneys, I have attorneys here in Arizona, I have attorneys in California, I have attorneys who, yes, live in Washington, D.C., New York, I have attorneys who live in New Orleans. We have a large legal team for this because this is a serious matter and because this is important for me to start repairing my reputation and also for the truth about our election administration. So we have no shortage of talent and time to be able to commit to this. All right, and let's wrap on this. So let's change gears a little bit because all of this is happening in an election year. Yeah. And you are up for re-election and uh, you just filed your paperwork. I did, um, yes. How many signatures do you need? How many signatures did you get? So we needed about 4,200 some, and we filed like 7,500, so with plenty of cushion to be able to withstand any sort of scrutiny. And a lot of those were online, which as you know, are automatically validated signatures. Yeah. And so, so, so and let me ask you this, I, I do wanna come back. I've asked you this before. I'm still curious, why did you decide to run as a Republican this time around? Why not run as an independent? Because there is a significant people uh, in the party, you know, Trump supporters, Kerry Lake supporters, who don't support you. And have been very clear and very vocal about being anti Stephen Richer. How come you decided to run the Republican and Party again? Then there are people who are very vocal about supporting me, and I think that's revealed in my fundraising numbers, which is more than all the other candidates for recorder combined. I'm a Republican because I believe in free markets, because I believe in the rule of law, because I believe in individual responsibility, because I believe in a strong America. That's why I've been a Republican for the past 20 years. That's why I will remain a Republican. That issue is a losing issue, and it is not dispositive, in my opinion, in the primary. That's why I'm going to run this race, and that's why I think we're going to be successful. All right. Thank you very much for joining us here today, Stephen Richer. Up next, I'm bringing in our panel to talk about all of this week's major headlines next on Politics Unplugged. Welcome back to Politics Unplugged. A lot to talk about this week, so let's get right to it. I'm joined now by Democratic consultant Don Penage and Republican Marcus Delartino. We have got a lot to talk about, and unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot of time this week, but let's uh, start with you, Marcus. We're not attorneys, but that doesn't stop us from pretending to be <laughs> such <laughs> at the table here. Never. But uh, uh, let's talk about a good legal strategy, good political strategy from Carrie Lake to attempt to at least turn the tables on Stephen Richer on this, and now she's saying, I'm going to try to make him prove that he suffered damages. I, uh, well, listen, would I prefer this whole thing not be going on? It, and I think any consultant will tell you this. You'd rather not have your, your candidate in a courtroom. You'd rather have them on the what? campaign. Um, but that being said, uh, you know, I, it, this debate's going to be going on. I think she reacted the best that she could under the circumstances. But my, the problem here is we're going to be talking about this. What this means is stretching out during the campaign um, is going to take away from, you know, the focal point and the issues of inflation and immigration, which most voters really want to know about. Yeah. And what did you take away from this, uh, this legal maneuver here? Were you surprised that she went ahead and just admitted default judgment on this in layman's terms is basically legally admitting in court that she, w she had defamed uh, Stephen Richer uh, in that? Were you surprised by this? Well, I think... Uh she is legal. The legal part, portion of it is admitting that she's at fault, but she continues to go on video and on Twitter and everything else and say that everything she's saying is true, which is not admitting it. And I think that this is really going to harm her. I think it feels good and they're getting lots of positive reinforcement from her locked in base. Mm -hmm. But the people who would actually have to elect her 
six, seven months from now don't want to be hearing this. Mm -hmm. I, and I think that this is ultimately going to hurt her in the general. I think that moderate voters absolutely see what this is and she's not letting it go when mm -hmm. she could. Well, let's, talk, let's get into the mindset of the voters and her supporters. They like the fact that Carrie Lake was this, quote, fighter, that she wasn't going to, you know, back down on any of this. Does this kind of hurt her with that image, with her basically backing down in court? I think we've, I mean, I've seen a little bit of that on Twitter, but surely it's not going to hold. I mean, those, when they're, it's like a Trump voter. You're, you're committed. You are committed and there's, mm -hmm. you know, you're not coming out of it. I think we've got to, I think there was a strategy here to get out of discovery and discovery um, is that process where you have to reveal who you've been talking to and what yeah. you've been talking about. It's like somebody going into your computer and looking at all your emails. Uh, the problem with that strategy is ultimately ended up backfiring because the judge came in the next morning and said, no, we're going to do discovery on damages. So um, it was a good route to go, but it didn't work out the way I think everybody thought it was going to. All right. And uh, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the, the, the Chris Mays interview and some of the stuff happening with her. Um, obviously, Republicans have launched another investigation into her. Is this good politics or what are you taking from this? You know, I think that a lot of Republicans are making the mistake of thinking that they can all follow a Trump playbook mm -hmm. of staying in the courthouse constant lawsuits and that this will somehow help them. But I don't think that's the case. I think it's arguable whether or not it works for Trump, but it certainly doesn't work at this level. So I think that they're just distracting from what they should really be doing, which is focusing on trying to win some of these campaigns they're in. And Marcus, let's talk about, you bring up Trump and Trump playbook. Let's talk about, uh, what, I think, an issue that hasn't been, uh, maybe it's a little underappreciated right now, and that is the infrastructure of the Republican Party. We saw some reporting now that in swing states across the country, Republicans, the RNC hasn't invested a lot of money in, in, into all of this, uh, into the, that ground game to get that out there. And we're also seeing that here in Arizona, that we haven't seen that kind of investment yet. I mean, is this something uh, that's going to hurt Republicans when it comes November to the general election? And one of the data points I'm looking at is that the state Republican Party is now announced that it's going to sell its downtown headquarters in Phoenix like nine months after they bought it. And they should. The office made absolutely no sense. It's in an office tower. You need key card access. Look, when you're looking at volunteers to show up to your place, you want um, first floor access. You want lots of parking. That office just never made sense for a GOP headquarters. So I'm on board with selling it. There's no doubt about that. So there's but no indication point, that this is a financial situation. <laughs> this is all strategic. Huh? I, you know, the new chairman of the, of the GOP has said that they're doing very well in fundraising. Of course, yeah. we'll know that when the when the numbers come out. Um, but again, I think we focus too much on the grassroots elements of campaigns that have changed so dramatically in the last five years, and certainly under Trump, um, where the, the grassroots component is not the, you don't need people sitting in an office licking envelopes anymore. Well, you're, you've been you've run some successful grassroots campaigns. How important is the grassroots in getting and mobilizing them in elections in a state like this where they can be decided by 10,000 to 20,000 votes? I mean, I would like to think that the people, the little people, will always matter in mm -hmm. an American democracy and in American elections. But it is also true that big dollars, big funders, and out-of-state interests are very much at the wheel. All right. I think we're going to have to end it at that. Thank you very much for joining us this week. And for those who do celebrate it, I wish you all a very happy Easter. Hope you're Join the holiday, but that's all the time we have. Good night.